we're just going to give a few minutes to let any latecomers join us. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Okay, and I think we might get started now. We can let anyone else in as they arrive. Okay, so good evening and welcome to this evening's event. I'm Elise Bass, a senior researcher here at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Thank you for joining us for this event, which is one from our series, Excavation, Confrontation and Repair, Family Histories of the Holocaust. This series is built around the library's digital copy of the International Tracing Service Archive, also known as ITS, and how we use it to support individualized research into Holocaust victims and survivors, usually on behalf of their families and descendants. We conceived this series as an opportunity for researchers and families to reflect on the processes and significance of family-based research and family history. We have already had one event in this series, a family reunion across time and space, which is available on our YouTube channel. And we have more events scheduled. So if you are interested, please do keep an eye on our events listing for more details of what's to come. It might be briefly worth considering why family research is worth using as a lens to think about the Holocaust. Research and representation is so often focused on the total number of victims, these vast, almost unimaginable figures of six million murdered, or at the very opposite end of the spectrum, focused on one individual and their path of persecution. A focus on the family, however, is just as important a lens. During the Holocaust itself, family groups were targeted and killed en masse to an unprecedented degree. And indeed, the consequences of these brutal destruction of family ties can still be felt today. Equally, there are countless cases of family units cooperating in efforts to ensure the survival of at least some members of the family, where individuals sacrificed themselves or endured extra hardship for the good of their family unit. In the immediate post-war period as well, some of the first impulses of the survivors was to try and find any family members who remained alive. So both during and after the Holocaust, family is key to understanding what happened and what motivated people, both perpetrators and victims. We continue to see the importance of family as a lens through which people engage with the Holocaust today. For example, in the cases we research in the International Tracing Service Archive, people want to know what happened to their grandparents, their great aunts and uncles, and to the cousins they never got to meet. In terms of tonight's event, we wanted to place the ITS archive and the work that we do with it in the broader context of family history and family documentation in the library. Mary Brabetch, senior researcher on our copy of the ITS archive, is going to talk about that archive and how we use it in the library. 
Also speaking this evening are Howard Falkson, our senior archivist, and Torsten Nugel, photo archivist, both from our collections team, who are going to talk about family papers and images that we hold in our collection. Helen Lewandowski, our project officer, is also here to talk a little about how she is using the family papers from our collection in our ongoing Refugee Family Papers project. Thank you very much as well to Greg Toff, who is helping with behind the scenes technical assistance this evening. Before we start, just a couple of notes of housekeeping. Um, your microphones are muted, so if you have a general topic about the a general question about the topic or the presentation, pop it into the chat box at the bottom of the screen and we'll try to get to it at the end, depending on time. Any questions specific to your family can be sent to us by email after tonight's event. Our details will be circulated after the event. Uh, we are recording this um, this evening and we'll be loading it onto YouTube later, but your screen won't be shown, um, so don't worry about privacy. And we have automated closed captioning, which you can toggle on and off by clicking the ellipsis and then the more feature at the bottom of your screen, then choose to include subtitles. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Howard. Hello, everybody. My name is Howard. I'm the senior archivist here at the Been the Holocaust Library, and I'm responsible for managing the document collections. Um, that's just, I think the first thing I should say is our collections can't really support um, family history research in the traditional sense, i.e. the construction of genealogies and pedigrees, <clears throat> the kind of thing that you'd expect to do with long lists of names from birth, marriage and death registers, etc. With the exception of the International Tracing Service Archive, which my colleague Mary is going to talk about later, and a number of uh, Holocaust memorial books in the reading room, um, we, can't, we can only offer what I would describe as qualitative research into individual families. And we have something in the region of over 300, 350 collections of original papers from families who've uh, fled the Nazis, uh, overwhelming majority of whom were Jewish. So I've selected content from three collections just to give you a flavor of the sorts of material we have and to give you an idea of how, how you can use it. And um, I'm going to share my screen with you right now. Uh, so, stop, help me stop at the beginning. So, um, what we have within the document collections are hundreds of hundreds of collections of papers. Many of them date back to the 19th century and sometimes beyond. So, uh, of, obviously, many of the many of the collections will also include material from the Nazi era. But what I'm going to show you now uh, will often predate that. Um, one of the collections we have is from uh, Chernovitz and the Bukovina, uh, the Fokshana family. This is a very interesting collection because, um, firstly, we've got very few collections that document the German Jewish presence in this area, uh, which was once a very thriving uh, cosmopolitan community from the 19th century uh, until the Nazis pretty much eradicated it. And you could say that this collection documents in microcosm the fate of that community. So, there's a, sh a short um, introduction that you can read, but I'm going to go on to the first document, which is a certificate uh, con conferring on Max Fokshana the right to vote in the Book of Vienna Parliament, which is quite significant because it meant that at this time in the halcyon days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, Jews could vote in Parliament and they enjoyed almost equal rights with all other citizens. Uh, the story is one of a gradual erosion of rights up until 1942 when they had to flee for their lives. So here, after the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Romanians um, ruled Chernovitz and Bukovina. And here you see an example of uh, a gymnasium school certificate. And you can see it's in Romanian and German. Uh, it's a Jewish gymnasium or grammar school. And 
the interesting feature of this document I always find is the number of languages that the, um, the student Otto Fokshana studied. So he was studying Greek, Latin, Romanian, French and German, um, which kind of, um, when you think of the English <laughs> uh, education system now, it doesn't exactly promote the, the study of languages. And finally, within this collection, I'm going to show you an affidavit in lieu of a passport where the, uh, the family, the Fokshana family, managed to flee with the, literally with the clothes that they were standing up in. Um, this document was actually uh, produced in Bucharest where they'd fled to, and they managed to get to Palestine and, um, and, and save themselves. My next collection is uh, the Vala family. Now, there are many collections of Jewish, uh, Jewish family papers uh, contain material where the, the protagonists had actually converted to Christianity. And in this case, uh, this family had converted to Catholicism. So Karl Wahle, who was a, a lawyer, and quite a distinguished judge, he converted to Catholicism in the early part of the 1900s and um, out of conviction. Um, whereas his wife, um, Hedvig, she was a, a, a exceptional mathematician and an actuary, but she, she decided to become Catholic more out of pragmatism much later in the 1930s. They had two children, Francis on the left and Anna, who were uh, sent over to England on the kinder transport and went to Catholic schools. Francis became a Catholic priest and Anna became a, an ordained nun. In actual fact, it was the mother superior from the convent where she'd uh, spent her last years that contacted me with the archive once she passed away. Um, so the, the mother and father managed to survive in hiding throughout the war in Vienna. And here you can see an example of a, um, a tram pass with a, a name, they use a false name on the tram pass. And they basically lived uh, hiding in plain sight. So they, they took fairly menial jobs, kept moving from one house to the other, and, and incredibly they managed to uh, survive arrest, more than one arrest, they managed to still um, live out to the end of the war. And um, at the end of the war, they, um, uh, they remained in Vienna and Karl Wahler went on to become the president of the Supreme Court for a period of seven years, which is the highest legal position in the country. The two children carried on living in the uh, UK and they spent the rest of their lives pretty much in the UK. And here, I mean, quite often in these families, collections of family papers, it's the correspondence that's the most interesting material. And this particular collection had reams of correspondence. And fortunately for us, not only was the incoming material, the in incoming correspondence retained, but here you've got an example of an outgoing letter that he kept the copy of. And he, and he explains in some detail his experiences, this is Karl Wahler, um, hiding in hiding in Vienna during the uh, Nazi era. In fact, I, I managed to contact Francis, the retired priest, uh, and he came to help me identify many of the individuals in the correspondence. That's why it's always, it's always good to try and cultivate good um, contacts with either the donors or their families because it can help really and help, um, help enhance the collections. My final example is going to be the only example that we have of a collection that documents the fate of a black mixed race family. The gist chap Ronnie Roberts is the son of Evandale Roberts who came to uh, Germany on a music scholarship in 1911, uh, was in turn during the First World War and when he emerged from internment as a British subject, when he emerged from internment, he was um, he became a very successful musician, jazz musician, and he met Alma. And the two of them had these two children. You can't. See, oh, you've got um, Ronnie and uh, his sister Beryl. Um, Beryl went on to become a, a nightclub singer in Switzerland. She managed to escape the Nazi persecution, but Ronnie, uh, he had all sorts of um, uh, things happen to him. He spent um, various periods incarcerated throughout the war. 
And while he was incarcerated uh, for one period, his plan was to, um, he decided that he was going to open his own cocktail bar uh, once he emerged at the end of the war. And here we have a, an original um, uh, recipe book for, or for cocktails in German that he planned on making. And lo and behold, true to form, Ronnie did what he said he was going to do. And here's press cuttings of Ronnie uh, in, in Zanzibar in 1947 in Vienna. Um, he went on to do all sorts of different things, but ultimately ended up in Devon, uh, where the, the family met and married Ka uh, Carol and they ran a hotel together. So there, there ends my little, little talk. I'm going to pass you over now to my colleague, Torsten, who's going to explain something about the, um, the photo, uh, Wien Library photograph collections. So I need to come out of here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the event tonight. Uh, since time is limited, I'm jumping right in, if that's okay. Uh, as Howard just set out, family papers make a great deal of our archival collections. And it's probably no surprise these papers include a considerable amount of family photographs as well. With family photographs, I'm referring mainly to private photography that captures various moments and events of people's everyday life. Um, this can include pictures of friends and family members, um, travels and outings, parties, social events, etc. So basically the kind of personal pictures most people with access to cameras take and collect over the course of their lives. Now the collections of such photographs in our archive differ quite a bit in terms of uh, scope and content. The largest collection contains more than 2000 images while others just comprise a few single items. Some collections cover decades and include um, family members from several generations. Others simply show a few individuals at a very specific point in time. The oldest photos we have date back to the 1880s, whilst the most recent ones are just from the last decade. And although we aim to collect material of people from various backgrounds and countries, the majority of our family photo collections come from German and Austrian Jews. In other words, there's quite a disparity in terms of what's available in our archive. Now, in this respect, there's no essential difference between the photographs and the text-based documents from the family papers. And like these documents, the photographs too can provide us with insights into the lives of individuals and families who have been murdered, persecuted, or otherwise affected by the Nazi regime, just in a different way, obviously. They are, without a doubt, I would say, a valuable source for both family uh, research and remembrance. Now, to give you an impression of what these photos can look like, um, how we can approach them and what they might tell us, I'm going to share my screen with you. Oh, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, they're coming from a collection I'm currently working on, and it's um, an exceptionally rich collection coming from a man named Ernst Levy, um, born into a Jewish German family in the mid 1890s, Ernst and his wife fled Nazi Germany in 1938, I believe, and immigrated to the UK. Okay, now let's see if that works with screen sharing. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So first we have two pictures of the Levy family. Both were taken in 1910. The one on the left is showing young Ernst with his sisters and a cousin, I believe. The way the kids pose, as well as the clothes they wear, are quite typical for a certain social class at the time. A similar impression is given by the image on the right, showing the parents of Ernst, an aunt, and his grandmother. They too are dressed typically for what we can consider uh, a well-off middle-class family. So at first glance, these pictures allow us not only to connect names with faces, they can also give us a rough idea of um, the family's social situation. The next images depict 
announced as a soldier. In this case, it's not entirely clear when they were taken, but we can make out some clues. Um, the one on the left is showing Ernst in what clearly is an off-duty situation. He's um, the one standing in the middle of cleaning his jacket. Um, this one here. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the hat he's wearing or the other, uh, the other people in the photo as well. Um, these particular kind of hats were worn by recruits or lower ranks of the German army at this time. And that indicates the picture is from the early days of his military service, which started in late 1913, as we know from his documents. The image on the right um, was taken later and is showing Ernst during World War I. He and another soldier are standing at what seems to be the damaged train station of Grodno, the town that's today in Belarus. Apparently he was deployed at the Eastern Front. And since Grodno was not occupied until September 1915, as we know from the historical record, this picture can date to autumn 1915 earliest. After the war, Ernst um, joined the lumber business of his father in Berlin. On the left, we see the yard of one of the company's storage and production facilities. On the right, we're seeing Ernst in a meeting with other managers or business partners. He's the man reading the newspaper. Um, unfortunately, it's it cannot really be deduced when exactly these pictures were taken, but what can be deduced from them and similar looking images throughout the collection is that the business went quite well and Ernst had a prospering life and career during the 1920s and early 30s. Now that started to change when the Nazis came to power and ended with Ernst leaving the country. An image that gives us an idea of the difficulties of this period is this one, taken during a holiday trip in 1936. It's actually a snapshot rather than a picture. And um, when we have a closer look at it, it's clear why. The text here reads, Jews are not wanted in the town of Fürstenberg. The image is interesting not only because it captures the omnipresent hostility towards Jews, but taking the picture itself can be seen as an act of defiance or even clandestine resistance, if you want so. Um, it had to be taken quickly because it was obviously dangerous for a Jewish person to be caught documenting this form of anti-Semitism. And that's likely the reason why um, uh, the image is a snapshot rather than a proper picture. Um, my point here is that taking and preserving pictures like this one at a time like that um, can tell us something about the personality um, of the photographer, as does, by the way, um, the highly ironic caption that was later added to the image and that says, a warm welcome to Fürstenberg. So studying family photos from our archive can provide us with valuable insights into the lives of people who were persecuted by the Nazis. And in addition to that, they also play a role in commemorating these people. That's especially true when these photos are the only preserved visuals of people who have been murdered in the Holocaust, as it appears to be the case here. This is the wedding photo of uh, Fritz and Lili Binash. Lili was a cousin of Ernst and Fritz was one of his closest friends. The couple had emigrated to the Netherlands in the late 1930s where they got trapped after the beginning of the war. Uh, and after being interned in the Westerbork camp for a while, Fritz, Lili and their children were eventually deported to Sobibor in 1943 and they were murdered there. Now, I would like to introduce you to a Dutch website called Jod's Monument or Jewish Monument. Maybe some of you have heard of it. 
the Jewish monument is a digital remembrance project that commemorates the more than 104,000 people who were persecuted as Jews in the Netherlands and who did not survive the Holocaust. It aims to preserve their individual stories and where possible, give them back their faces. And this is where the wedding photo comes into play. This is a screenshot from the page for Fritz Binash on the Jewish Monument website. And we can see there are some um, information available about him, including the addresses where he lived, and of course his family members. There are even pictures of uh, Lily and two of the three kids. What's missing is an image of Fritz himself. Um, so far, there's only um, a name on a blank icon. But with the wedding photo preserved in the Levy family collection, we can change that, and we will do so once our work is uh, uh, once our work on this collection is finished. We will share the image and maybe some additional information with the Jewish Monument website to have it uploaded and integrated in their wonderful remembrance project. Project that is, by the way, open for everybody to contribute. That's just one small example of how family photos from our archive can contribute to preserving the memory of Nazi victims. And with our Refugee Family Papers Project, the Wiener Holocaust Library is currently working on its own sort of digital memory project. And um, I believe my wonderful colleague Helen will tell you more about that in a sec. Thank you. Thank you so much, Torsten. I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. So just as, uh, as Torsten mentioned, um, my name's Helen. I'm managing a project to redevelop our Refugee Family Papers map resource. And this is uh, work supported by the Designated Development Fund from Arts Council England. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the map itself but also discuss the types of materials that the new resource will present. Uh, the library holds the UK's largest archives of personal papers relating to Jewish refugees from Nazi Europe. So there's quite a lot of material. I'm gonna just show you a couple of different types um, and uh, including documents and photos and often a combination of the two, as you can see here with the search notice, um, how these are used towards telling family stories for a, a general audience. So just gonna so this is our old map uh, the original map launched in 2015 and it provided a, a visual reference for the collection each family uh, collection you can see the numbers here and some individual photos uh, are represented by a pin on the map um, with a location related to the family's origins or or where they were bef before the war um, and you can see that it's the original locations because there's no pins in the UK at all, and uh, quite a lot of these families settled in, in the UK. Uh, and and you, can, you can see with a basic interface like this, we were able to post um, uh, quite a lot of material, but each collection, it was only a very limited amount of photos and documents that we could show, just a handful of images and one short audio clip. Uh, so amongst other improvements, um, our relaunched online map, uh, which will we'll launch in autumn 2021, will allow us to trace families' journeys where they settled, as well as add more resources and documents that reflect the breadth of the Family Papers Archive. And this will enable us to use objects more engagingly to, to tell, bring to life, and preserve important stories of the individuals and families that fled from uh, Nazi persecution. So I'm going to go now through just a, a couple of different types of materials and how we can use these these to bring out the, the voice and stories of families. So, and, and while I'm speaking, please take a, a close look at these, these images and read the captions. Um, I, I really love these materials, so I, I hope you'll, you enjoy uh, looking at them as well. So this first group of materials I'm going to speak about are, are memoirs, annotated photos or 
photo albums, written or audio interviews with, with former refugees and their relatives. And these are quite directly in their own voices with explicit intention to preserve their history for, for future generations in a public audience. And this is really one of my absolute favorite objects in the collection. It's, a, it's a, as you can see here, a family photo album uh, annotated by uh, Louis Alexander Linton, formerly Ludwig Alexander Lieberman for his two children, Ava and Albert. And, and these are just a few selected pages from that album. And the captions are absolutely enchanting. They're written by um, uh, Lewis. So it takes us through his life, uh, including you can see here childhood snapshots from the early 1900s in, in Berlin. We have here on the, the right, uh, his service um, uh, portraits of him in uniform for the First World War. Uh, continuing onwards, we see uh, snapshots for his trips in, in Europe in the 1920s uh, and a reference to um, meeting his, his wife, uh, Susan Maria Linton, born Susan Maria Friedman. Uh, and on the right here, a page related to the, the birth of his children with a really just wonderfully tender caption. So as well as this, he, there's pictures of his life in the UK from the late 1930s and 1960s. And I can share a couple of biographical facts related to this point. Ludwig went to England in 1937 uh, with his wife and two children following him later that year. And in 1940, uh, the family was separated and interned uh, for nine months at a various internment camps. So after the family's relief, Ludwig uh, could not find work uh, in the, the, the chemical industry, which he had been doing up till that point uh, due to his nationality and started working as a teacher, continued with this work until several years after the war. And the family was then naturalized in 1947 and changed their names by deed poll in the same year. So we have those biographical facts, but I think a, an object like this, a photo album like this, just does such a, a, a wonderful job of drawing you into his world with these very sad and tender and humorous captions in a way text like that really can't. So you can see him discussing his, uh, his mother um, passing away here, taking pride in his, his lawn in Wembley and a, a new car and later up and later on, and this is Ludwig here on, um, uh, in, in this area in the second half of the page. He's talking, he says, uh, you are growing up, your father's getting old and that's his daughter grown up on the top right. So the next kind of group, loose group of materials I want to mention are correspondence. So that includes letters, Red Cross letters and telegrams is not written, really written expressly for a future audience, but they provide us with vivid details about what the families were experiencing. And they give us a very personal view, often a family member or friend's own commentary regarding their, their everyday experiences as refugees. And here I've included an example, um, a, a letter from Elise Kablinski to her husband, um, Siggy during their internment on the uh, Isle of Man in 1940 and they were in separate camps so she, she writes in English here as a way of getting through the censors um, more quickly. We have fantastic material like this in the collection. So a third group of material uh, we might consider within this framework are travel and administrative personal documents which tell us indirectly um, what the individuals or family members were experiencing, where they went, what happened in their lives. And this includes things like ID cards, passport stamps, birth naturalization certificates, wedding, divorce decrees, uh, job references, shipping lists, ticket stubs, all that kind of uh, material. That in essence, is, is many of the same types of important documents that we would preserve ourselves. And to show you an example of how this can be used to to tell somebody's story. We have um, on the left here, a uh, Jewish refugee registration card issued in Shanghai, including a, a photo of uh, Pauline uh, Markstein uh, in, in her early 20s um, with information on her, her education, her uh, former occupation as a secretary. And on the right, we can see from a general job reference letter that she worked for a few years as a managing director of a restaurant in Shanghai um, from uh, 1943 to 1945. 
Uh, now we can see that she's remarried in Shanghai in 1947 to an American, uh, leaving shortly after for California, as we can see here on the right via immigration transit documents. So although we don't have a memoir, we're not drawing upon a memoir of something written in uh, uh, Pauline's own uh, writing, we can really get a sense of uh, what her life was, really a vivid insight into her world um, in the 1930s and 1940s. All right, a final group I'd like to touch upon of the kind of documents that we look at are ephemera and other assort assorted materials, such as news clippings. Um, and the very fact that an individual or family chose to preserve these items tells a lot about their importance or impact on um, the, the individual or the family. Uh, here, I've included a rather disturbing note that Ludwig Neumann received anonymously from a neighbor in, in Prenton, a neighborhood in uh, Birkenhead. Uh, in 1947 and clearly preserved for many years. Uh, so the map's ability to add more content, to present multiple stages of a family or individual's journey in life as refugees, allow us to paint a more detailed and a nuanced picture of what life was like in their adopted new um, homes, rather than focusing entirely on their lives be before the war. And I, I hope that, um, that uh, you've enjoyed looking at a, few, a selection of the different materials um, I've shown this evening. I look forward to sharing the new resource with you all in autumn 2021. And, and should you have um, family papers that you're interested in donating to the, um, to the library, we're, we're always actively looking to um, have acquisitions and add things to this uh, living resource. Um, so it, it won't be a static map, we will continue to add uh, any donations and um, further family collections to it. So please do get in touch if that's something of interest. And now I think I can hand it over to my colleague, Mary, who's going to tell us a little bit about ITS. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mary and I am one of the two senior um, ITS researchers. And as Helen mentioned, I am gonna walk you through a bit about ITS. Let me share my screen with you really quick. Perfect. <clears throat> so um, what Elise and I specifically do is we help families searching for information about the fates of their families um, during the Holocaust. And uh, the primary resource that we use is the International Tracing Service Archive. Um, the archive is absolutely vast. It has um, information on over 17.5 million people um, spread across 30 million documents. Uh, we have a digital copy of that archive um, at the Wiener Li Library. Um, we received a copy in 2011, and so we are the primary resource for the UK for that. There is a physical archive still um, located in Germany. It's known as the Arlson Archives now, and it's held in Bad Arlson, Germany. Um, and they've also made a, a selection of their papers available online as well, which you can access through their website. And um, it gives you kind of um, a basic understanding of the information that they have. But when we research for families, we definitely go much deeper than what's available on the online resource. So as for what's actually in the archive, <clears throat> the archive itself um, has a card catalog of sorts uh, known as the Central Name Index. And this is where we start our search when we're looking for information about an individual. Um, it, it directs us to um, various locations in the archive where we can find information um, because it's not like a Google search. Unfortunately, we can't just search, input somebody's name and then get all of the files uh, listed uh, about that individual. So this is where we start. And um, it's, it's organized by using a sound deck system instead of alphabetically. So when we're doing our research, we really have to think about how a German, most likely a German, would hear different names and write it phonetically. So the system is really smart. So even if we search the correct um, alphabetical um, spelling of a name, it will bring up all the, the variations that it could possibly be as well. And then we also get creative and think about like my name, my last name is Robets and it ends with the CZ, which is Hungarian, but the way it's pronounced is a TS sound. So if I was searching for an individual with a similar name to myself, I would also 
um, change the spelling to have a TS at the end since that's how it's heard. So we do um, dig deep when we start uh, into the central name index. So as far as what kind of records are kept in the archive, um, the, the first selection of records um, that, we that we have are usually related to concentration camps and ghettos. So you can see here is an example of a, a prisoner card from, from Buchenwald. Excuse me, this is a gentleman named Abraham Pasternak. He was a Hungarian Jew. And um, you can see this was his card for when he arrived at Buchenwald. So on one side of the screen, you can see that there's um, all of the information about where he lived, um, where he came from, when he transferred to Buchenwald. There's personal um, descriptions of him, how tall he is, the color of his hair, his eye color, what languages he speaks. And in this case, in Abraham's case, there's actually a photo included, which isn't always the case on these records. Um, and when it comes to concentration camp records, um, I do caution that we don't have extensive documentation for all camps. And um, we do have limited resources for um, ghettos as well, because in some cases the records were destroyed or they weren't able to be saved. Um, but other cases like Buchenwald, we have uh, almost the entire collection of records. So uh, we, we're always happy to dig and see what there is um, to find. Another example of wartime records that we have copies of are transportation lists. So as individuals were moved between camps, as they were moved from their homes to various locations, um, sometimes the transport records were saved. So in a lot of cases where we may not have camp records, sometimes we can find transport records to see where somebody went, even if there's not evidence of them at the final location, we can still see pieces of the path. And so here I have a copy of a transport from December, 1943 um, from Treasonstadt to um, Auschwitz. And you can see it includes the person's name, what their job was, their birth date. And in this case, it includes the information of their original transport from when they arrived to trees and stuff as well. Uh, also in the International Tracing Service, we have copies of post-war documentation. So if you have a family member perhaps that did not go through the camp system and you don't think that this would be very helpful, this is actually where we can pick up a lot of those family members who didn't go through that camp system because um, they were, they were uh, registered at the various places they were throughout Europe. So you'll see here is a copy of a displaced person's uh, registration record for Ellie Wiesel, and includes um, a lot of great information, not only his birth date, where he's from, but there's several family names on here. So if you have a family member who you only remember, perhaps one person's name, but you can't remember the rest of the family, a lot of times as we're doing our search, we can find additional family names. And you know, we're always happy to keep digging um, as we find more names and just finding the pieces of the puzzle to help you, you uh, create a history of your family. So um, continuing here, you can see that, that Mr. Rizal wanted to go to Israel. Um, you can see all of his information on, on, on uh, where, where he was before the war. You can even see a copy of his signature and when, when the card was originally filled out as well. Um, another uh, example of, of post-war information we have is what we call a care and maintenance file. So as um, refugees uh, wanted to receive support, they had to fill out or have somebody help them fill out one of these care and maintenance files. And it gives really detailed information um, as far as family members, uh, what their path was during the war, uh, where they were, 12 years prior, what jobs they were doing 12 years prior, um, any affiliations, any groups that they belong to post-war or during the war, after the war, and where they currently are. And um, a lot of times these will include personal pictures. Sometimes we get narratives with them of exactly what a family experienced or a person experienced during the war. So these can be really, really detailed, but they can also be really, really minimal too. We just don't know until we search for your family member how, how detailed um, they'll be. Another example of information we can get in the records is um, after the war, 
uh, when people were searching for information on their families, um, if the International Tracing Service had evidence of somebody's final fate, they could provide death certificates. So this is a copy of a death certificate um, for this individual, individual George Beckman, who uh, perished in Mauthausen. And the reason it lists is uh, shot trying while trying to escape, and which may or may not be the case, but that's what was listed in the death book for that camp. And um, it also includes his prisoner number, his nationality. So there's lots of information that we can we can get from we can glean from each of these records. Uh, another example of information that we can get from these um, in the tracing service is. Uh, certificates that they would issue, such as certificates of incarceration. Here you can see this gentleman uh, lists out exactly where he was during the war. They've listed any evidence that they found and where they found it um, to prove that, that that was his location during the war. So people could use this for restitution claims or um, other legal reasons, or just to have official evidence of, of what they experienced during the war. We also have copies of a lot of the immigration documents. Here you can see a ship's manifest from December 1951 um, that also has a lot of pertinent um, information as far as occupation, nationality, um, who sponsored them and where they were headed. Um, so now that you've seen what is here, I'm sure you're, you're, you're wondering how you can start your own search if you're interested in having a search for you in the International Tracing Service. So one of the first things we would ask you to do is to gather a list of names of all the individuals you would like us to search. Um, any biographical information that you have as well is always helpful. Um, if you don't know it, that's fine. We're always happy to look. But the more data points that you have, uh, the more we can be certain that uh, the individuals we're seeking uh, are the correct people. Because in, in some cases, you we have really common names. And uh, sometimes it's really difficult to work out who is who in the records. So um, don't let that, that, that convince you not to search, but just to say that the more information you have, the more we can be, be certain. Um, so gather up all that information, and then you can apply online uh, through our website, which you'll get a copy of the link to be able to do that. And uh, we do have a wait list currently, if you would like us to do the search for you, we're about two to three months um, backlogged at the moment with uh, the everybody quarantined at home. We're finding a lot of cases where people are digging into their family history for the first time. So we do have a big bit of a backlog at the moment. But um, once we do start looking on working on your case, uh, how we proceed is we go through all of those different cards and examples that I showed you. And we collect, collect all the information for each individual. And basically we're trying to find the puzzle pieces of somebody's life. And then as we build the picture, we're looking for where the holes are. And then where we see holes, if we can't find the information in the uh, International Tracing Service archive, then we go to other archives that we have access to. So um, we try as best we can to plug all the holes so we can build the most complete picture. So that um, by the end of our research, that we're able to write you a narrative of exactly what happened to your family member during the war. And we give you a copy of all evidence that we've found um, throughout our search and explain what all of the information is as well. And uh, if you have any questions, you're always more than welcome to get a hold of us. Um, additionally, we always try to give you next steps if um, your information, if you're interested in finding out more, if perhaps we didn't find any any information anywhere that we searched. Um, we try to give you somewhere else to go to, to seek help if we know somebody else that could help you. So we try not to be a brick wall in your search, um, but we never know until we start digging uh, what we can find about an individual or their family. And um, regardless of, of what your family member's situation was, whether they were in the East, whether they were West, um, whether they went into Russia, um, we just never know what we're going to find in the archive. It's so vast that um, there's it's essentially archives of archives. So we're always happy to search. It never hurts to submit a request. Um, once the library reopens properly and the reading room opens properly, you're also welcome to book uh, in-person uh, 
research if you would like to do the research yourself, but I think we're a little ways off from that yet. But in the meantime, if you would like us to do the research, we're always more than willing to do that for you. So I think that's pretty much everything about the ITS. Um, I will hand it back to Elise from here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. Thank you everyone for speaking there. Um, if you have in, any questions in the chat, um, oh, there's one that's just come in there from Lynn asking whether we collaborate with other archives. Lynn, do you mean there for ITS research specifically or more generally? Um, okay, yep, ITS specifically. Um, I'm a, the senior, I'm a senior researcher alongside Mary on ITS. Um, I know that I do sometimes try and collaborate with other archives. Um, for example, if there's nothing that I can find, I might email a specific camp memorial or archive to see if they can help. But quite often we have to sort of stop researching at some point and, and I'll sort of say, well, you could now do this. This could this would be the next step I would suggest for you. So sometimes I will reach out if there's sort of a really specific reason for me to, but more often than not, I just try and point you in the right direction, signposting the way to go. Mary, is that is that your approach as well? Yeah, uh, definitely. And but we do reach out um, in some ways. Uh, for example, I recently had a case where a family uh, went through a specific ghetto and I discovered that the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. had a copy of a letter that this person's grandparents had written ghetto administration when they received notice that they were going to be deported. And so I was able to get a copy of the letter for the family and copies of their ID cards, which the museum also held, and I was able to give them to the family. So we do reach out um, where we can, but as Elise said, there comes a point where uh, sometimes it's better for the family to, to, to reach out to, certain, to a certain extent. That's definitely the case. Sometimes family members definitely get more of a response than, than researchers who aren't um, connected by, uh, by blood. So that's worth bearing in mind as well. You're welcome. Um, just thinking, uh, Howard and Torsten, if anyone in the audience now is thinking of wondering about whether they might be able to donate their family papers to, to the collection at the library, would one of you mind sort of briefly talking through that process and sort of how it would work and where material might end up being used? I mean, I know Helen's example is, is obviously key, um, but where else they might be used as well? That might be helpful. Austin, shall I start? And then, um, yeah, well, we, you know, we, as, as I mentioned, um, well, as I think uh, uh, Helen also mentioned, we're still actively collecting. This last year has probably been our worst year in terms of acquiring new material, but we probably average about 50 or 60 collections a year in a normal year. And of course, they can range from just one postcard to 50 boxes. There's no limit to the size of an archive. Um, and, the, and the idea is that, that once we've secured them and they're safe within the building and we've repackaged them, eventually we get to process them and catalogue them and then make them accessible via our online catalogue so that researchers can come in and make use of them. And we get all sorts of uh, um, uses. I mean, many students, especially postgrad students who are, who are researching in depth, uh, the social conditions of Jews in Vienna or Berlin or Prague or wherever it was, will quite often make use of our uh, correspondence. Um, and we also get requests from the media. Increasingly, more and more um, people want to use material to be published. And of course, there we have to be careful because we don't, in, in most cases, we don't own the copyright to a lot of our content. So in that case, we try and assist readers um, to make contact with the uh, copyright owners. And of course, copyright is very long lasting. So um, people can inherit it without even knowing it. Um, but if, if we're possible, we'll try and put people in contact with the copyright holder because it's in our interest that people make use of, of, the, of the archives. The, the two pillars of our remit are preserve and make accessible. And so in other words, if somebody offered us material, but said, I want you to preserve it, but I don't want anyone to look at it, then we'd have to refuse it, obviously, because uh, 
that's not part of our remit. That said, there may be cases, and we've had, and Torsten will back me up there, there have been cases where there's content within an archive that we felt inappropriate for public consumption. And so we've embargoed it um, for a much later date, or we leave an offer material back to the donor. But where the majority of the collections are uh, not going to be made publicly available, then we we would think twice about taking it in the first place. But I'll hand you over to Torsten, because Torsten may be able to explain a bit more about the publication of, or the use of material in publications or in, in, in the media, that kind of thing. Uh, thanks, Howard. Well, that was quite comprehensive, actually. Uh, there's not much I can add. Um, yeah, as you just said, um, we get a lot of media requests uh, for using images from our collections. And um, in cases um, where the pictures or the documents are not embargoed, we um, obviously um, license them accordingly and provide uh, the press uh, with these pictures. And that could cover really all kinds of uh, projects certain newspaper articles or uh, academic articles or really whatever, anything. Um, yeah, I don't know, just, I guess there's not much to add. I know when I first started at the library, um, an old colleague saying that the photos were sometimes used in, in, re in ways that you just wouldn't anticipate. And she was saying that they'd had a researcher in looking at old family photos from the Alps and looking at the snow line to provide evidence of climate change, so see where the snow line was in the 20s and 30s, compare it to now. So there's all this information that is contained in these photographs and these documents, which I think is, um, can be used in very, uh, yeah, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. It's, that's exactly right. So basically our job is to catalog the material and make it available to the public, and then the public does with the material whatever it wants to do with it. Well, hey, not quite whatever it wants. No, it, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, no, we, point. yeah, there are, there have definitely been instances where we haven't shared, as, as Howard said, where we haven't shared material, where we don't think it's appropriate. And um, so, yes, it's not, sort of a, not ethical, ethical and copyright concerns, which we have oh, yeah. in-depth discussions about um, at work. And um, Howard, I think there's just one more question that I think you might be best place to answer. And um, Jeanette is asking, what happens to information donated to the library you decide not to retain? Would it just not be taken in the first place or is it about disposal? Well, as I said, I mean, and at the point of accession, I mean, when people contact us in the first place, it's usually because they've got material that we're, that we're going to be interested in. And uh, and obviously I'll, I'll give it an initial appraisal, either in the home of the donor or they'll bring it into the library. Uh, and if, if at, at that glance, at that first meeting, it becomes immediately obvious that this is not really our thing, or, heaven forfend, it's got mould damage and which could actually affect the whole archive, then I'll sort of say no, and no thanks very much. But more typically what happens is we'll be offered a, a collection of, say, two or three boxes, and I won't have the time to, you know, painstakingly go through every page or every folder, so I'll accept it, but our donor agreement has the provision that if there is material within an, uh, a collection that we find is either not appropriate or doesn't fit our remit, we will, in the first instance, offer it back to the donor. Uh, and if they don't want it, we'll just dispose of it. But uh, yeah, it does happen that we don't always take everything. In fact, that's a, that's a sort of a, a strategy that we're kind of taking uh, we're doing more frequently now because in the past, again, Torsten will back me up here, we've probably taken in more material than we should have in the sense that, um, you know, we don't need 500 snapshots of the same beach, uh, but one or two will do, you know, a sample of photographs, whereas in the past we've tended to take things lock, stock and barrel. So, um, but, you know, space is an absolute premium where we are, so we can't, you know, we want to continue to grow but um, we want to grow with relevant, appropriate material, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I can't see any more questions coming into the chat and we are actually now at an hour. 
So unless there's anything pressing that anyone would like to ask or add, I'd like to thank you all again for coming and thank you very much as well to the speakers this evening. It was really interesting to hear what everyone's working on for me as well, because we're all so separate now. It's really great to see what's happening with everyone. Um, oh, one last quick question. What do you do about material in other languages? Is translating an ongoing project? Um, we accept material in other languages, is that right, Howard? But we don't necessarily offer a translation service. Well, language, language is definitely not a barrier to, uh, um, to receiving material. We will take it in any language, but as you can imagine, it's mostly European languages, sometimes Yiddish or Hebrew, but we'll take it in whatever language, as long as the subject matter fits our remit. And we do have uh, people that can assist with making sense of material. Providing ver verbatim translations of entire archives is something that we probably wouldn't do. But uh, in the past, we've, we've certainly done a fair amount of, uh, of summarizing in English, using volunteers who were brought up on those languages and also brought up on those scripts. Because don't forget, the handwriting can quite often be, uh, to, even to a native German speaker, some of the old handwriting, the, the current schrift or the Zutterling schrift can be almost like hieroglyphics. So uh, um, we have provided in the past, what we tended to do is provide summaries in English of the content of a given, of a given folder of papers, just because we know that the donors more often than not can't understand the content of their own archives. So we know there's a burning desire on their part to have some sense of what's in there. And that's why we've done it. So in a way we're quite unique in that sense because the service that we provide to, to donors is kind of over and above what you'd expect in most typical sort of local authority archives or other repositories. But we can only really do it where the resources allow us to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great, um, thank you, Howard. Um, Victoria, that's, that's very kind. We'll, we'll include um, um, some information about anyone who would like to join us for volunteering for translation um, in the handout that we send around. Um, I think on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye.